For many people, Paul Poberezny's life began on January 26, 1953, when he and about 35 fellow airplane enthusiasts gathered at Curtis Wright Airport in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, for the first meeting of a local home-built airplane club. That club would become the Experimental Aircraft Association, an organization that would grow to include more than 175,000 members over the next 60 years, and whose annual convention would become the largest event of its kind in the world. Even by that time, however, Paul seemed destined to have a life tied to aviation. Born in 1921, his family lived in a tar paper shack that, as fate would have it, lay under a busy airmail route. He'd always look up when the early airmail pilots would pass overhead, and from age five, as he'd later say, every day of my life, I have spoken the word airplane. By the time he was eight, he'd converted part of the family chicken coop into his first airplane factory, building crude models out of scrap lumber. When Paul was 15, his history teacher, Homer Tangney, presented him with an extraordinary gift, a damaged Waco primary glider. Tangney didn't ask for any money, but simply gave Paul the glider on the condition that he restore it and fly it. The glider was finished in the spring of 1937, and 16-year-old Paul became a self-trained pilot. At 19, Paul borrowed $125 from his father and bought half of an American Eagle biplane with a friend. That Eagle was my college education, Paul liked to say. It gave me opportunities to meet people through forced landings. It provided extensive experience in maintenance, and it helped develop my piloting skills. As was the case with many young American men after the attack on Pearl Harbor in December of 1941, Paul joined the Army. There, he first earned his wings as a glider pilot, then became a civilian flight instructor at the U.S. Army Primary Flying School in Arkansas. He soon earned his commission and spent the remainder of the war as a ferry pilot. Throughout his service, his rank and roles varied, but he never stopped flying always choosing flying over career advancement. An example was the last line in Paul's World War II pilot logbook that reads, so ends my army flying, damn it. Back home, Paul settled into post-war life with his wife Audrey, a high school sweetheart he'd married in 1944. In October of 1946, Audrey gave birth to their first child, Thomas Paul Poberezny. Eight years later, they were blessed with their second child, a daughter named Bonnie Lou Poberezny. In 1952, Paul again served his country, this time flying C-47s during the Korean War for a year before returning home to a full-time job with the Wisconsin Air National Guard. It was then, at Audrey's suggestion, that he organized a fledgling group of local Milwaukee home builders, leading to that first meeting in January of 1953. When asked about starting EAA, Paul said, none of us knew at the time what it would become. To us, it was just another flying club. That little flying club was poised to change the future of aviation. And thus, with little more than a can-do attitude, a table, a chair, and a typewriter, EAA was born. Paul and Audrey began to publish a newsletter called The Experimenter, which later became EAA's flagship publication, Sport Aviation. Then, in September 1953, EAA hosted its first fly-in at Curtis Wright Airport as part of the Wisconsin Air Pageant an event that brought in 22 aircraft and about 150 people. EAA's national exposure came in 1954, when Mechanics Illustrated ran a feature article about Paul and his baby ace. Within three days of publication, Paul received 126 letters asking for more information about EAA. By the time they hosted their second fly-in, EAA had grown to more than 200 members and had approved the first of what would eventually become 1,000 local EAA chapters. 
Despite the requirements of his full-time job with the National Guard, Paul would personally respond to everyone who took an interest in the group. Of these early years, Paul said, if it hadn't been for Audrey, I wouldn't have been able to handle it. Fortunately, I had her support and the support of my Air Guard unit. They believed what I was doing was a benefit to all in aviation. EAA's steady growth continued with the organization's office moving out of the Poberezny home in the mid-60s and into a new office and museum complex in the Milwaukee area. In 1969, Paul and the EAA board made a historic decision and moved the annual fly-in convention from Rockford, Illinois to Oshkosh, Wisconsin. But it wasn't until 1983 that EAA's home office was moved permanently to the newly completed EAA Aviation Center, giving EAA a year-round home in Oshkosh. Paul's leadership and his mantra, everyone is welcome, who do we tell to stay away, saw the fly-in convention grow to become the largest in the world with a half million people annually embracing all aspects of aviation, from ultralights to modern military aircraft, and even spacecraft. But no matter how big the fly-in got, Paul could always be seen on the grounds, driving his trademark red Volkswagen Beetle, Red One, personally greeting as many of the thousands of visitors as he possibly could. Paul was also increasingly recognized as a leader within the aviation community, and his long-standing relationship with the Federal Aviation Administration found him traveling frequently to Washington, D.C. for conferences on aviation safety and policy. This solidified EAA's position and paved the way for initiatives such as the ultralight and the light sport aircraft rules, auto gas STCs, and of course, the increase of amateur-built aircraft under what is known as the 51% rule. EAA's visibility and respected influence throughout the entire aviation community grew, as did EAA's membership. The organization reached 100,000 members in 1987, a far cry from those three dozen aviators who had met nearly 35 years earlier. Paul retired as EAA's president in 1989, passing the reins on to his son Tom, but stayed on as chairman of the board for another 20 years. Paul became an elder statesman of aviation, receiving many honors, including induction to the National Aviation Hall of Fame in 1999. It was there that the poor lad from Wisconsin joined the pantheon of aviation legends, such as the Wright brothers, Jimmy Doolittle, Neil Armstrong, and Paul's own personal hero, Charles Lindbergh. Paul Poberezny had truly become an American success story, taking an idea and his personal abilities to create something that the public found fascinating and inviting. When Paul stepped down as EAA chairman in 2009, nobody was surprised when the first thing he did was to start building another airplane. Until his passing, Paul was true to his passion for flight. His simple plan to organize local aircraft builders and restorers had become a worldwide organization that's given thousands of people the motivation to fly, build, and share all things aviation. Over the years, Paul has been honored many times, but his greatest reward was always the people a worldwide family of like-minded pilots, craftsmen, and enthusiasts. Paul often referred to himself and Audrey as millionaires because, as he said, we had a million friends. And, as usual, Paul was just being modest. <laughs>